Good evening. My name is Omani Abu, and I work for the City of Glendale Water Services Department. Joining me tonight is Joanne Toms, who also works for the City of Glendale Water Services Department, and Charlie Alcorn, our guest presenter with Watershed Management Group. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's Green Living class. The topic for tonight's class is an exciting one on rainwater harvesting. Before diving in, let's go over some webinar logistics. For some of you, it might be your first time in Zoom. Um, all attendees are muted and the class will be recorded. The recording will be available on the city's water conservation website and YouTube channel in about a week. You can type your questions and comments in the Q&A or chat functions and Joanne and I will read and respond to as many as we can throughout the webinar. The class is scheduled to be about an hour and a half long we have one hour allotted for the presentation and about 30 minutes for questions. We will aim to stay on track as we wanna be respectful of your time. If you experience any significant technical difficulties, please contact Joanne Toms via email or phone. Her email is jtoms at glendaleaz.com or you can call her at 623-930-3596. After this presentation, we'll follow up with an email that includes a copy of the PowerPoint, resources, recording, and a link to the survey. If you complete the survey, you'll be entered to win a free gift card from a local nursery. So don't miss out on the chance to enter for a chance to win. For some Zoom attendee features, here's what your current view might resemble. You can play around with the features so you're comfortable. You can click and drag the vertical bar located in between the presenter and the presentation to enlarge or shrink the presentation view. You can also adjust the audio settings in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Feel free to send comments using the chat button or share your questions using the Q&A button. Joanne and I will do our best to answer questions during the presentation as they come in, but we should have enough time for Charlie to answer questions at the end of his presentation. Um, there's some uh, Glendale rain gardens here, so I would like to share two of them that you can visit. One is located at the Glendale Main Library in Xeriscape Garden at 5959 West Brown Street. The other rain garden is located at the former Glendale Community Center North at 14075 North 59th Avenue. We know it can be inspiring to see demonstration sites in person to gather ideas of what your own site can achieve. I personally find the flow of water to be very soothing. And if we get some rain soon, you can see them in action. Uh, both rain gardens were actually completed in partnership with Watershed Management Group. And speaking of Watershed Management Group, this workshop wouldn't be possible without them. And I'm very excited to introduce to you our presenter tonight. Charlie Alcorn is a program coordinator for the Green Living Co-op at Watershed Management Group, where he coordinates the consultation and design program for residential water harvesting systems and manages projects installing rain tanks, gray water systems, and implementing earthworks at residential properties. Charlie graduated with a degree in physics from Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. After working in communications and as an educator in environmental nonprofits in the United States and abroad, he continued his education and received a graduate certificate in water policy from the University of Arizona. His interests include empowering individuals with skills and information to help them improve their quality of life and to support a healthy environment. Everyone, please help me welcome Charlie Alcorn. Thanks, Simone. Um, as you mentioned, my name's Charlie Alcorn. I'm a program coordinator at Watershed. Um, I work a lot with our Green Living Co-op. Um, and so as was mentioned, we do design and consultation and installation for rainwater harvesting systems. That's um, the tank systems that we're gonna talk about tonight, earthwork systems or landscaping, and also we'll do gray water installations, which won't be covered tonight, but was a uh, a topic of one of the other Green Living Series presentations. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm wondering, I think you have to stop sharing your screen and then I can throw mine up. Thank you.
Um, so first, I want to start and just say thank you to the city of Glendale and the Glendale Water Services Department. This Green Living series is really cool. Uh, the classes are fantastic. I've watched the series last year um, and just really good quality presentations, really good information um, and things that you, uh, you know, I think we can all apply to our own yards and landscapes. So really excited to be a part of the series and um, as a watershed are really happy to be partnering with Glendale um, to be able to share something we're so excited about, which is rainwater harvesting. So tonight's class, really the big focus and what I'm hoping to share with you tonight is to give you ideas and ways to reduce um, your potable water use for your irrigation needs. We're gonna look at utilizing rainwater harvesting practices and using rainwater harvesting principles to implement what we call earthworks or kind of shaping your landscape to harvest rainwater. And then I'm also gonna get a little bit into um, plans for installing a tank system and some of the best practices or things to consider if you're hoping or planning to install a rain tank. And uh, I'm gonna try and make this class a little bit, uh, you know, have some participation in it um, just to keep things exciting. And so I wanna, or I'm curious to see in the chat, anyone who, if people have an irrigation system and if you do have an irrigation system, what are you irrigating? What is in your landscape? So I'm gonna, oops, I can uh, actually, I can look at the chat while still presenting. I'm gonna look at the chat and see what are people working with in the in the landscape? And if you're not familiar, you know, Mune um, already mentioned uh, that you can find the chat along the, um, there's a bar. If you either go to the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that should say chat and you just tap on that. I'll even say hi, everyone. Type in there. Okay, so we have a sprinkler system for a, a dead lawn and landscape plants. We have some trees, bushes, and flowers. Ooh, okay, flood irrigated backyard. No irrigation yet. Ooh, we have a water harvester in the audience. Joanne uh, is irrigating her yard with rainwater from a garden hose and has some grass in the backyard using sprinklers watering a veggie garden. Ooh, and the gardener as well. Cool, irrigation. We have someone using for veggie gardens, citrus trees, shrubs and trees. So great, we do have quite a lot of people that are using irrigation and, and making use of the irrigation at watering things so they can have a, a lush landscape. That's great to see. Um, so a few tips before we even dive into water harvesting principles and look at some of the things you can do with your landscape. A few tips on what to look at to start to try and reduce your irrigation needs um, right now, <laughs> right away. And those things are check your monthly irrigation system and settings. Uh, a really simple way to say it is if you're irrigating the same with the same amount of water in the summer as you are in the winter time, likely you are overwatering in the winter. We don't often see people underwatering in the summer, so, but um, we do a lot of times see people overwatering in the winter time. So check your irrigation settings. And I know there was a class about irrigation. So there was probably a lot of really helpful information shared in that class. And I believe it's gonna be going up um, as a recording. And so you can see it if you didn't get to see it live. Another thing is Planting, or planting the water before you put the plants in, and we're gonna be talking about that tonight. But uh, another really important thing to consider is when can you plant with native plants? Native plants are adapted to our environment uh, and they're generally low, low water use. Uh, along with native plants and irrigation, uh, if you have native plants in your landscape and they've been there for two or three years, they're really not needing to rely on irrigation anymore. Once they've had a period of time, one or two years to get established and their root system to develop, their native plants, they're here, you know, and have a 
acclimated to our climate, they're native to our climate, so they are able to survive our hot summers and our long periods of time without rain. And then last thing, taking into consideration, um, you know, options for rainwater harvesting and gray water harvesting. If you have some plants or features in your yard that are thirstier than our native plants, I'm thinking of veggie gardens and fruit trees are really great to have in your yard. Um, they bring a lot of joy, they provide us food. So how can we supply, bring, bring some rainwater to those um, exciting features in our yard? And on the right side here, we have a picture of our living lab and learning center, oopsies. Living Lab and Learning Center. And this landscape here, flowering, we have some veggies growing, we have a peach tree. All of this is supported uh, with either gray water or rainwater. This is totally off of the porter, uh, potable water irrigation. So you can have a lush green landscape growing food just with the support of rainwater and gray water. Uh, we do have an, our rainwater system hooked up to be an irrigation system. So this isn't just water falling from the sky and supporting these plants. We're storing the rainwater and we uh, have an irrigation plan so that this peach tree is getting watered in the summertime. These veggies are getting watered in the summertime, but they're getting watered with stored rainwater. To give us a little context of what we're working with in the Glendale area, I looked up and saw you receive or we receive about 9.2 inches of rain per year. And since we're early in the presentation, I'm going to, you know, ask us to do a little something that's challenging. Uh, it's still kind of early in the evening. And I know I'm going to use a four letter word that a lot of us don't like to hear, and that's math. I'm going to have us do a little bit of math. And what I want us just to see is how much water reaches your roof in a one inch rain event. And so what I have here is just a little um, multiplication equation where if you know your roof area or just have a general idea of the square footage of your roof area, I want you to multiply that by 0 0.083 and then multiply that by 7.4. And I have a little bit, or I have a small example of that. Um, just for a 1,000 square foot roof. And I'd love to see again in the chat um, what numbers people come up with, but you do 0 0.083 uh, and then times your square footage of your roof. In this example, we have 1,000 square feet and then times 7.48. And in this example, we have about 620 gallons. So what that is saying is that for a one inch rain event, a 1,000 square foot roof is receiving 620 gallons. I saw someone, uh, something come up in the chat. 1,800 gallons, 1,863 gallons, quite a bit of water from a one, one inch rain. I'll give people a little bit more time to uh, do the math. And this is the only time I'll ask you to do math. I know this is, uh, <laughs> not everyone's excited about about doing math, especially after a long day of work, probably. 993 gallons, 982 gallons. So that's off of one inch of rain. We're collecting nearly a thousand gallons, just over a thousand gallons with the 1,149. Okay, great. People are doing the math. So I'm hoping that gets you a little excited about how much rain hits your roof just in a one inch event. Taking that and expanding that to our, the whole year, and I'm going to stick with the 1,000 square foot roof example. In Glendale, with the, I think I rounded it to be nine inches. With nine inches of rain, a 1,000 square foot roof is going to get 5,600 gallons of water per year. If we look at that in context of our landscape, so how much water is running along our landscape um, after a one inch rain event, 1,000 square feet of uh, your landscape is going to have about 2,800 of gallons of water um, flowing along it throughout the year. And the reason these two numbers are different, so it's the same area, but we're working with two different numbers because when water hits your roof, that water hits the roof and runs right off. So that water is accessible. It's water you can use. Uh, in your landscape, we estimate that about 50% of the water that reaches your soil 
right away is um, just sinks into your soil, which is a great thing. That's what we want. We want the water to sink into your soil. That's going to eventually be the um, what's providing water to your plants. So we say that your landscape is going to have about half of that water reaching it sink into the soil right away. And then the other half of it is water that you could start to direct to different places of your yard. And that's when we start to get into the rainwater harvesting side of things. Looking at that, that for a fifth of an acre parcel, we're looking about at about 45,000 gallons of water per year, just reaching one acre of land. Um, and this is in Glendale, nine inches of rain per year. And, um, you know, thousands of gallons, tens of thousands of gallons. I know these numbers, they're numbers that are, it's hard to put a, like much context to such a, a big number. But to tie that into what we use daily um, in, in our home or just potable water use in general, I looked this number up. I think there's probably a more up-to-date number because I think this is from a number of a few years ago. But I saw that estimated that 87 or 80, a person in Glendale uses 87 gallons of water per day. If we were to associate that with a three person household, so three people using 87 gallons a day, 365 days a year, that household is using 95,000 gallons of water per year. That's potable water that they're using. And it's a general estimate that about 30% of the water, potable water you're using goes to your landscape. That 30% adds, uh, is 20, it adds up to 28,000 gallons of water. And so we, if we were to look at how much water is falling on our landscape, about 45,000 gallons, and how much water are we using for irrigation, about 28,000 gallons, we're, we have a lot more water reaching our landscape from the sky than we really need um, for our irrigation needs. Why is it then that we don't have, you know, lush green landscapes and fountains in our yards? Well, it's because of our climate. We're living in a desert where um, evaporation acts very quickly. We also have really long dry periods and those are the hottest times of year. So that's why we are not all living in a jungle setting. Um, is just the heat and the evaporation. And really we do receive quite a bit less water um, per in, in inches than other parts of the country. But a few numbers to consider, a few you know things to look at to say, there's a lot of potential and a lot of benefit you can have from starting to make use of that rainwater. So rainwater harvesting principles, um, there's a man named Brad Lancaster. He is now an internationally known celebrity. I wouldn't say he developed these principles, but he has popularized them and wrote a book about them. Rainwater harvesting has uh, happened around the world for thousands of years. Um, so these practices are not new. They are very old and um, a lot of them are very traditional. But Brad Lancaster wrote a book, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, and that is a fantastic resource for anyone that is interested in rainwater harvesting and interest, you know, excited by anything that's shared during this class and wants to learn more. That is a great book. It's also the book that we use as kind of the framework for a lot of the work that we do and the um, practices that we use. And so I like to share his principles because they're a great foundation to work with when you're starting to think about how to harvest the rainwater on your landscape. And to start with his principles, we start with begin with long and thoughtful observation. And so what does that mean? It can mean when it's raining, go outside and just look at how the water flows along your landscape. We like to say that uh, people, places in your landscape, you wanna be high and places where you want water to go, where you're planting things should be low points. So people places are high points in your landscape and water slash plant places are the lower points. And part of the observation process and kind of planning process when you're first starting to do rainwater harvesting, it's a good idea to draw a map, draw, draw kind of an outline of what you're working with. Uh, here we have an aerial vid image, so a little bit, you know, of extra work. You really can draw this just on a piece of paper, draw the outline of your property, 
draw any of the impervious surfaces that are on your property. So that's probably your home. So an outline of your roof and then maybe any shed that's on your property or on your backyard. Another thing you can draw is any shade trees or any vegetation that you know is not going anywhere. You can see in this aerial picture here, there's signs of a shade tree in the front yard here. There's signs of a few shade trees in the back. So that's something that you can include in any map or planning um, piece of paper that you're planning on. And then what you wanna do maybe when it's raining is go outside and start to observe where's the water pooling on your property. And just in general, how is it moving? We have these blue lines on this property showing how is the water moving when it comes in contact with your roof. Here we have a um, two-sided roof. It's pitched to two different parts of the landscape. In the front yard, the water is flowing onto the street. In the backyard, it's going to, you know, it's falling a different, few different um, paths. So draw out where is the water pooling and think about do you want the water sitting there or is that a people place and you want that to be a high point. Another thing to think about is where's the sun the hottest on your landscape? Where are you getting, you know, high levels of sun exposure? Where are your shady parts of your landscape? Um, and that changes between the summer and the winter time. So, may, you know, you can even make that observation twice a year. And that's, you know, to get you thinking, mm, where can you benefit from having a shade tree um, to start providing some shade from those really hot parts of your yard? Other things to think about are utilities. So are there electric lines above or below ground? Is there, where is your water line? Where is your gas line? If you're gonna put a shovel in the ground um, or start digging in the ground, it's uh, pretty important, very important to know where your utility lines are. A number you can call to find that out, and I believe this is across all of Arizona, is 811 or Arizona Dig. Um, they will mark your utilities from the street to your meter. And that will give you a general idea of where, where these lines are, where you don't wanna be digging. Another thing to plan out, yep, existing vegetation, so where, is your, where are your trees? If you're um, concerned about addressing noise or traffic around your house, um, thinking about what are the sources of the noise, which, way, which direction is it coming from? You can even think about what soils you're working with. And what you wanna do is kind of plan out, or what you can do next is plan out, what are your mini watersheds on your landscape? Uh, in this example here, we're, the person's kind of breaking up the roof into different sections so that maybe you could consider setting up some gutters and, and connecting that gutter to a rain tank to store water. Or maybe you know that all this side of the roof here, you want to have runner, water runoff to support a, shade, a tree that's providing shade in the front of your landscape. So thinking about your water or your landscape as little watersheds and thinking about where you want water to pool and settle and sink into the ground within those watersheds and what plants are in those little mini watersheds benefiting from that water. Next water harvesting principle is to start at the top. So some benefits to starting at the top or at the high point is that that's where the water is gonna be the highest quality um, and the cleanest. And that's also looking at how you're intervening or doing something with the water when it's still you know, at a low volume and relatively low speed. Uh, for our watersheds and our properties, usually the top of the watershed is your roof. So think about once the water reaches your roof, how is it traveling uh, along your roof? Are there gutters? And if there are gutters, that's quite a bit, you know, that's a large volume of water that's gonna be starting to travel pretty quickly and then enter your landscape. So what do you, can you do to start to manage that larger volume of water that's um, starting to move quickly, probably through the gutter pipe? Well, maybe you can put a basin or uh, a ditch kind of, a, <laughs> I'll talk about basins a little later, but a low point in your yard for the water to pool and slow down so it doesn't just um, kind of leave the gutter system and then rush off your landscape. So maybe uh, once the water's flown off your roof, if it's not going to a tank and being stored, plan to start to manage it and slow it down and help it sink early on in your the, the high on the slope of your property. As it travels along your landscape, it's gonna pick up in volume, it's gonna pick up in speed and it's also going to pick up some soil and just get a little bit you know murkier have sediment in it pick up some rocks and what we really encourage you 
to do is try and manage the water and keep the water on your property. Uh, I, you know, so much with planning and what we see is we can look at the water that's falling on your property as a resource. The, all the water that's reaching your property can go be stored on your property and be benefiting the shade producing trees, the flowering plants that you love, a veggie garden. Once the water reaches your street, it kind of gets a different identity. It, you know, people look at it as storm water, they look at it as flooding, and it, as it travels downstream, people just say, look at it as a nuisance. So let's do something with the water when it's falling on your property, and we can look at it as a resource instead of something that's kind of a nuisance that we wanna just send downstream and have it be someone else's problem. This might be my favorite water harvesting principle, just an application. So start small and simple. Uh, this is the big one to take away. This is the one I <laughs> really encourage everyone to do tonight. And uh, we have a staff person at Watershed that I think really embraces this very well. His rule when he's working in his backyard is a project should not last longer than a cup of coffee or a can of beer. So on a Saturday morning, he'll go out in his yard, shovel in his hand, and a, in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other hand, and maybe his plan is to dig a basin and plant, you know, a tree or a shrub. And so he'll start with a coffee, sip it, um, and over time as he's digging the basin, coffee's gone, and by the time the coffee's finished, he has his basin dug out and he has his tree planted. And that's the work for the day. And I think a benefit to starting small and simple is that then you can go back to water harvesting principle number one, long and thoughtful observation. So now that you have this basin that's wonderful, maybe uh, is a basin that's sitting next to a bush or a shrub or a tree in your landscape, observe how does water flow in your landscape differently now that you've put that very simple basin in the ground. And from there, you can make an observation and plan out what you're going to do next. Water harvesting principle number four, we have spread and infiltrate the flow of water. So this is a principle that really applies uh, on very large scale work that we do in river restoration, but we can apply this to residential work. We can look at this on our property. Spread and infiltrate the flow of the water. That's really what we want to do to keep the water on our property and um, prevent it from flowing off. So looking at, this is a little mini landscape here. We have a little strip of water flowing. And if you could just picture, th there's a little bit of a slope that we're supposed to imagine, but the water is flowing down slope and it's just kind of rushing past all these shrubs, we'll say, or trees that, well, they don't have any green leaves on them. So they must, they probably aren't doing so well. They're probably not benefiting from this water. So we observe that happening. And then we think, okay, start small, start high, start simple. Well, what's a simple thing we could do? Just put a little speed bump, you know, dig out some dirt um, so that the water will have to slow down a little bit before it makes it over this little speed bump. And when you do that and have this little shape, kind of the, the U shape, what you'll see is the water isn't just gonna stay in that pattern of going straight down and rushing by, it'll kind of spread out and they'll go to different points of the landscape. And then keeping with our theme of small, simple, well, let's just do the same thing a little bit later in the landscape and now a little bit closer to the trees where the water is now starting to spread. And what we'll see is the water maybe is gonna start to pool. It's slowed down as we've gone farther down and now it's able to pool and start to sink into the soil. And what do you know? The trees start to grow leaves. They're starting to benefit from the water sinking and uh, slowing and sinking. And then that is provides just kind of cyclical situation where the water is going to continue to slow and spread as these trees grow, the root systems develop. The next water harvesting principle, always plan for an overflow route and manage overflow as a resource. So this is not an example of that. <laughs> Do not do this. <laughs> so what we have here is they plan for overflow. They obviously thought about it. There's some pipes here that are intentionally directing this water. Uh, and unfortunately, the water is going onto the sidewalk. A lot of wet shoes probably uh, in this little community area here. Well, if you know, let's observe what's happening. We have the water not flowing 
along this area where you know there's just gravel not a people not as much of a people place and the water is flowing to our people place along the sidewalk well with seeing this what i think is why don't we dig a little basin why don't we make this a low point of where the overflow is going so that the water is not flowing in the sidewalk it's flowing into this basin that gives us an opportunity to maybe plant some native plants some flowering plants that's going to bring beauty to this landscape um, and it's going to keep people's shoes nice and dry in this area so we don't want to see this happening this is not planning for your overflow and it's not treating it like a resource at either here's an example of treating your overflow like a resource and you can follow my cursor or follow the this little blue stripe but we have the water running off the roof and it's getting collected in a gutter system and then just being sent kind of to the side of the house um, by pipe. And high up here, we have a basin. So this is a depression in the ground right here on the top. And then we have what we call a berm. So this is a berm is just a raised area, usually raised with dirt. So the idea is you dig your basin to hold the water and then you create a berm to raise the sides of, of your basin and make sure that the water doesn't spill over to a place you don't want it to go. If we follow the path of this water, we see it fills this basin and the overflow. Well, it follows this little kind of channel here, a little path, and it fills up another basin. Once that basin fills up, we just follow the path of the water and it goes to our final basin, probably a really large basin able to hold a lot of water. So here's what it looks like to plan for your overflow goes from one basin to the next basin, fills up, and then to the final basin. I think to add some you know, additional benefits to this, why not put some shade trees along this berm? Maybe some shade to provide to the roof. You know, Once this water is pooling in the basins, there is so much benefit you can start to bring to your landscape. This is where the water is pooling. This is where you can have vegetation benefiting from that pooling water. Next principle, we have maximize the living and organic ground cover. So what we're looking at here is a really simple basin, just a, again, a depression in the earth, earth, a glorified ditch. It has rock work around it because it's kind of steep on the sides. Um, and I can, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but inside the basin, we got some large wood chips. That's our organic material that is providing so many benefits to this basin and to the landscape. First, it's hold, helping hold moisture in the soil um, and the wood chips act as themselves little sponges holding water. The wood chips are also providing a cover from really in the intense sun. So it's providing some shelter and keeping the soil a little bit cooler in those hot sunny days. Over time, as these wood chips are exposed to water and then dry out and then get exposed to water again, they're breaking down and that, that organic material that's breaking down is providing nutrients to the soil that the plants then have access to. And it's also breaking down and just improving the quality of the soil. Our desert soils are really um, lacking organic materials and that is not helpful to, it's really, um, they're not great at holding water. So adding organic material to our desert soils is gonna increase its, their ability to hold water, increase their ability to receive water, and just generally contributes to this kind of system that's going to start feeding itself um, and running off of rainwater. And if you're curious to see what a basin, just a simple basin like this looks like after four or five years, it turns into something like this. <laughs> and this is beautiful. We have a, I believe this is a willow tree. This tree is now providing shade to all the smaller shrubs that are underneath um, of its canopy. This willow tree is now contributing to the organic material that's falling into the basin, providing um, organic material that's going to break down and benefit the soil and benefit everything underneath uh, or benefit the plants that are looking for nutrients in that soil. So once you have the basin and once you have the organic mulch there, this system really starts to feed itself. And it's just a cyclical thing that keeps on benefiting from rainwater when it comes in. Uh, for all, you know, a lot of our work, almost all of our work, we work with native plants because they're already adapted and able to handle the really dry periods, but also are really happy to receive high volumes of water um, when it does rain. Next thing to think about um, is stack stacking functions or maximizing the beneficial relationships and efficiency in your landscape. 
So to a normal person, this just looks like we got some flowers here, we got some bushes and a tree. Okay, well, once we, you know, put on your water harvesting lens or your permaculture lens, and there's a lot of interrelationship happening here. There's a lot of complementing features happening. We have these flowering plants, you know, these are encouraging pollinators to come by, native species. These are also flowering plants that are going to make us happy. They're pretty, they're nice to walk by. These flowering plants are probably in a little bit of, you know, at certain times of the day being shaded by this tree here. So they're receiving shade from this tree. That's a little bit of a beneficial relationship. What is this tree doing here? Well, it's also providing shade to, on our sidewalk here. So it's, you know, keeping people comfortable. It's likely dropping litter that's falling into, it looks like a basin um, where this bush is sitting. And I believe this bush is a wolfberry, uh, it is, which is producing food for, again, native animals or just any animal that's coming by, um, which is, so that's, again, benefiting the, our native systems, our natural systems. Also these, shade, these um, bushes are, if we're thinking about this being kind of a community area or an area where you have our neighbors are next to each other, well, these bushes are providing some screening either from sound or just generally providing privacy between neighbors. So this landscape, you know, when you put your water harvesting lens on it, there's a lot of things happening and a lot of systems that are benefiting each other. Your flowering plants, your shade providers, the shade provider is benefiting everything around it by keeping things cool. And then we have more people benefits by um, having screening from sound or just visual screening. Next, continually reassess your system. With rainwater harvesting, you know, start small and simple, see how things work. Uh, if things are working well, move on and, you know, put in your next basin or do your next little project. If things don't go well, well, observe what happened and then start to reassess. In the Southwest in our monsoon season, especially, you know, we're seeing more and more, our rain events are pretty, un, you know, pretty unpredictable. We'll have hundred year rain events um, happening more often than once every hundred years. And so making adjustments to your system doesn't mean that you failed. It just means that you need to plan, you know, to have a little bit more of a resilient system next time. What we have showing here is there's a basin that we had kind of a rock barrier protect or preventing water from overflowing that basin. Well, a large rain event came along, one that we didn't, we weren't ready, you know, didn't size the basin for. And so that large rain event blew out our basin. And really all that means is we have to redo our rock work. We have to take an afternoon, reset our rocks, maybe get some larger boulders so that they're not as easily knocked over by a larger rain event. And last principle, have fun with this. Uh, I've found that water harvesting is slightly addicting. Uh, it's really fun. It's such a nice thing to share with friends. And once you start doing projects in your backyard and you kind of become the little expert among your social circle, people will start to invite you over to do projects in, in their yard. And so it's just a really nice thing to build community around um, and kind of nerd out and dig deeper into. So with that, I'm curious, would love to see in the chat, uh, thinking about your landscape, where are you with your water harvesting principles? Where, which one are you excited to start with? Or where do you think you're at? Which one spoke to you the most? And I have them listed here. I'd love to see um, what people connected with in those principles. Lots of observation. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. I think I've been observing for a few years now in my landscape. <laughs> I've done a little bit of projects, a few projects, but a lot of observation. Numbers four and five, spread and infiltrate the flow of water, plan for overflow. Great. That's really good. So you probably have some basins or you're planning to dig out some basins and think about once the one basin fills up, where is the water going to flow? Need some more observation. Great. Cool. Well, I hope everyone starts somewhere with the rainwater harvesting principles. Um, 
Number nine. Yeah, that's the one that, that's an important one to keep incorporate probably in all parts of your life. All right, I'm going to roll on and jump into passive systems or earthworks. So uh, we just talked about the rainwater harvesting principles. I talked about basins. I talked about um, gutter systems and, you know, them transporting water to your landscape. Well, starting with a really general overview of what is a passive rainwater harvesting system. Well, it's as simple as an area where you're collecting water, and that can be your roof. It can be a different part of your landscape where you want to direct water away from. Then you'll have a conveyance area, which is just uh, we're, we're using this is, you know, start to get into con intimidating words or words that are not so inviting. Really, it's just a way for the water to go from your collection area to your basin. Conveyance in this example, or the, the way we're directing water is some pipe and then a little channel or a little path for the water to flow along. And then we have our basin, our big, you know, kind of pool or tub-like ditch that is where we're uh, encouraging water to spread out, to sit and sink into the soil. And that's where our infiltration's happening. You'll see once we're reaching our basin, we start to think about having some plants in our basin, some grasses, and those grasses will help break up the soil and encourage the water to sink into the soil. Uh, and then, so this is the same picture. I think this is a fantastic picture. Looking, looking at some of the systems that we have happening in this simple water harvesting system or this simple earthwork system. As I was saying, there's some grasses that are helping break up our native soils. They're helping um, the water infiltrate. But even early on, we have a few different systems at play. We have what we call swale or the channel that's helping water be transported. A lot of times we'll use rocks as a way to help create structure and make sure that the water isn't picking up all of our dirt and soil and carrying it while it's traveling. So we'll do uh, rock protection for anywhere that the water is entering our basin. So it's kind of in a small um, path, the water is moving a little bit quicker and higher volume until it reaches, reaches this basin where it spreads out. So water is rushing along and we're protecting that sediment soil with rocks. We're also rocking areas that have a much higher slope or a steeper slope. Um, we're thinking about plants that are going to want to benefit and be around the basin, but maybe not have their feet soaking in the basin. So we have a tree um, able to access the water in the basin, but not sitting in the bottom of the basin like the grasses. And then again, once we're having the water leave our basin, we're thinking about having a place that the, the soil is protected by rock so that it's not picking up soil and carrying it away. What does this look like in real life? Well, it looks something like this. We have water flowing off the roof of this property, traveling by gutter through this pipe, Notice in this picture right away where we have the water leaving this pipe. So that's a lot of water moving pretty quickly. We're right away just putting rock on the ground and that's gonna help that, that the ground pre prevent the water from picking up sediment and carrying it into our basin. Once the water reaches our basin, it's spreading out really wide. It's slowing down and losing all, a lot of its momentum you kind of think of the water that's traveling through here, it's kind of rushing, thinking of like make, kind of like a hose, it's rushing through a really small path. And then once it reaches the basin, the water is filling up the basin more like you see a bathtub fill up. It's all raising at the same time. And then once it starts to infiltrate and sink into the soil, it's all dropping at the same time. Once this basin fills up, we have it going to, we plan for its overflow and we have it going to another basin. Uh, notice that we have plants strategically placed, and I'll talk a little bit about plant placement a little later. And there's a study that, I don't know the history of this study, but there was a study done that they showed for every dollar investment you have in rainwater harvesting, there's a $4.40 return. So what are the returns or how are you saving? Well, you're reducing your irrigation needs. You're likely reducing your need for air conditioning some because you're Provide, you're sending, bringing plants and um, 
yeah, bringing plants to your landscape that are providing shade and just helping create a cooler climate around your house and also possibly providing shade to your house. And then there's also just the benefit and joy of doing these projects at your home, supporting native, native habitat and having flowering plants if you want. Here's another example of a basin. Here we have water traveling um, and filling this basin and it's benefiting this citrus tree here. We have a rock lined basin. So the slope of this basin is probably somewhat steep. So you're, we're putting rock around that slope to make sure that soil isn't just getting picked up and carried and filling the basin back in. We're filling our basin with mulch, which is providing a lot of benefit. And then oh, we have a little baby mesquite tree, it looks like on the side here that's not in the basin but it's able to have our, its roots reach out and get access to the basin water. To talk a little bit about right tree and right place, as we like to say, and you'll see this in nature. If you go out hiking, um, you'll see plants place themselves where they want to be in, in the landscape. And the general idea is low, well, plants that have a very low water need, so cacti, agave, um, different succulents, um, and nat well, native plants that are succulents, they like to be higher in the landscape. They like to have water kind of flow along their base, but they don't want to have their feet soaking in the water. So that's kind of tier one, the high point of the landscape. Then we have tier two, where what we call a terrace. So that's a place where, okay, it's a little bit closer to where the water is pooling, but again, it's not get this, the tree in this example, it's not having its foundation soaked. It's not dipping its feet into the water. It's just kind of having its roots or its toes be able to have access to it. And then lastly, we have the basin where we're probably gonna find our grasses and our plants that like to really be inundated and, and surrounded by water pooling. A uh, little talk about rainwater harvesting you can do in the right of ways. I would highly recommend um, or yeah, really recommend you to reach out to any the permitting or planning office if you're thinking about doing this in your any right of way. But you can do rainwater harvesting along your streets. Um, there's machines that are core drills or um, machines that are able to cut cement, and they will are able to create kind of holes or openings in the sidewalk where street street water can flow into a basin. What that looks like is something right here. We have a curb cut. Um, so this, and this is all something that was done with approval from permitting in Tucson, so permitting and planning office in Tucson. But we have a curb cut here, water is flowing into the, this little basin along the side of the street, and in this case it's flowing. We're making sure that it's not picking up and kicking around a lot of soil by having it flow onto the rocks. But, and we're having some grasses in here to benefit from that water and help the water infiltrate into the soil. What, the, what it kind of looks like from regular street that we've probably all seen and baked on and felt the heat radiating off of, well, doing a little bit of a curb cut and putting some native plants in there, putting some mulch in, we have street water flowing into this um, lower area here. It's benefiting the plants. I see it's overflowing into another basin alongside, benefiting some more plants. And what this can look like over time is a much more lush uh, walking path. So we have over time the rain, and this is all rainwater fed. This is not on irrigation, it's or rainwater and stormwater fed. So we have a rush, lush landscape now um, and just kind of a, I'd say this looks a little bit more inviting and cool than um, this dry patch we have on the top left. At this point, do we have any questions? I think I shared a lot. I want to give a little bit of a pause for questions. Hey, Charlie, this is Joanne. Can hey. you hear me? Hey, Joanne. Yeah. All right. Um, so yes, we do have some questions. Um, we have a lot of observations and one person was just kind of saying that they didn't, it was kind of funny. They said they didn't uh, drink 
coffee or beer. Um, so they weren't sure, sure what you meant by a short uh, term project. And I said, probably about a half an hour, but I said, let's ask Charlie. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, kombucha, I'm not, I think find your favorite beverage, you know, 16 ounces of it, we'll say, and bring that outside and have that accompany you with your project. <laughs> I like it. And then a more another question is on roofs. Uh, I guess it depends on where you're from, roof or roof, and you know potential contamination concerns. Um, so, what's your take on that, Charlie? Mm -hmm. So, I guess you're when thinking about your roof, your roof, your water is really not going to drinking water. It's just going to your landscape in this case. I have not heard of any study or any cases where the roof is um, has any type of chemical that's getting picked up in a large enough volume that it is harming anyone's landscape. Um, the deeper you jump into rainwater harvesting, if you're thinking about collecting water for your tanks and, you know, if you want to go the route of providing potable water to your home from for using rainwater, you want to start to think about what's what are you coating your roof with. Um, and there are different roof coatings that are rated to be uh, part of a potable water harvesting system. And there's, you can do some research on that, but general, general rule of thumb for roofs is I'm, we have not, I haven't heard any of our staff express any concerns about roofs, you know, being an exposure point for anything harmful in the landscape. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that's my take too. I mean, I have, I wrote that I had a standard asphalt, you know, roof and um, I have 550 gallon capacity and I really just use that rainwater for my ornamentals, you know, in my landscape. So um, other than like chuparosa, which I eat and maybe, you know, Palo Verde flowers, I'm not eating a whole lot of my ornamentals. Um, but for my vegetable garden, I have two four by eight raised beds. I do use the garden hose for that. Um, so yeah, I, I think you make a good recommendation on, I guess it depends on what you're using the rainwater for. And then, you know, Brad Lancaster, that, uh, that, that book or the website, he does have some information there, um, on, you know, water quality concerns. Um, and then Charlie, maybe one more, um, comment that someone had was that they said they put in a rain gutter and water barrel last year. But now after seeing this, they have a basin idea. Can they have both? Oh, yes. What a wonderful pair. Earthworks and what we call earthworks, so which is what I just talked about, which and we also call that a passive system because water is just doing its thing. It's not being stored. It's just following the path that you're creating for it. Uh, and that is a great thing to pair with what we call a passive system. And I'm going to jump into those next but yeah uh, opportunity to store the water is a great complement to earthworks so that's exciting <laughs> yeah those were the main kind of questions and comments so far so take it away charlie you're doing great <laughs> thanks super so jumping into active systems and that question was a great kind of segue into this um we just talked about passive systems, earthworks. Active systems are when we are actively storing water, usually person intervention, um, and storing that water to have it be used in your landscape later on. The, here we go. Um, people that we talk to are very enthusiastic about active storage. I think, um, when we interact with people, they kind of associate, oh, rainwater harvesting, that's putting a tank in your yard and storing the water. And we're always kind of pushing, or I like to encourage people to think, well, start with your earthworks. It's First, it's less expensive. Um, and second, there is an awful lot of water harvesting and water storage you can do in your landscape and a lot of benefit you can do to your landscape just by shaping it and having water pool in the places you want it. and um, kind of flow past the places you don't want to have it pooling. If you're going to be storing rainwater um, and make that investment, uh, things that I would say or have you, you know, encourage you to incorporate into your landscape or a good reason to, to do rainwater harvesting with an active system is if you're wanting to produce food, 
and so you're needing to irrigate your garden during the summer when there's definitely not any rainwater and you definitely need to have water for your garden. Um, it is a awesome, exciting world to think about harvesting rainwater for drinking water. I can answer questions about that. We do that at our office um, in Tucson. And so it, there, it is possible it, we, our office totally runs on rainwater. So all the taps are connected to our rain tank. There's filtration and everything. We're doing it in a safe way and it's all approved, but uh, drinking water is a path you can go down. Another really good reason to install a tank is just flood pre prevention. Maybe your backyard or your parts of your yard are just inundated with water when it rains. We're getting larger rain events when they do happen. Um, so storing that water in a tank instead of have it possibly flooding your landscape is a good reason to install a tank. And then fire protection. We have seen situations where commercial buildings will store rain water in a tank and have that be part of their um, fire protection system, their sprinkler system. So usually I'm encouraging people to consider the earthworks as a solution before making the investment in the rain tank. Um, so yeah, just something to th think about. So if you're ready to, or curious about installing a tank at your, at your home, I'd say one of the first things to start to consider are what kind of tank or what size tank are you needing to install or could you install? Our limitations that I think we're all very aware of are how much money can we spend on this tank? How much space do we have in our yard to fit a tank? Because, and that is quite a limiting factor. Also, what is the seasonal supply that you really need to store? In the Southwest, in our region, we have two rainy seasons. We have our monsoon season and our winter rains. So when you're thinking about the size of your tank, you don't have to have a tank that's big enough to store all the water that reaches your roof um, throughout the whole year. We break our storage seasons or the times we're trying to store water into two parts of the year. Looking at Glendale, we have nine inches of rain per year. So we can say probably four and a half inches we receive in the monsoon season and four and a half inches we receive in the winter season. And it's really just that four and a half inches that you need a plan to store. And that is, you know, whatever you're collecting off your roof. I have the, um, you know, have the picture of the simple roof system that I was talking about before. What does four and a half or five inches of rain look like um, in volume? when looking at a thousand square foot roof, well, you're looking at storing between 2,400 gallons and 3,000 gallons. That itself is quite a large tank. And it doesn't mean, you know, just because you can store that water doesn't mean you need to, because you also want to pair however much water you're storing with what your landscape is actually needing. And then also, and someone kind of asked this question is, your tank system is a storage place, but water harvesting principle, always plan for your overflow. If you install a tank that is relatively small for how much water your roof is collecting and directing, well then just make sure you're planning for the overflow of your tank to go to a basin. And I'll have a, a little bit of an example of that. But yeah, thinking about your tank sizing, you're really only needing to collect for one rainy season because you collect for that rainy season and then you use the water during the dry season. You collect in the winter time so that you can use that those winter rains and store those winter rains for your dry season in the summer. And then hopefully your tank's just getting empty when we have that first monsoon rain and then you start to fill it up again. So yeah, thinking about, you know, pairing your tank storage with the plants that you have in your yard, you know, first revert back to, am I just irrigating my native plants? And if so, really those can survive quite well with the rainwater we receive. Yeah, put a basin next to them, but you don't need to store water in a tank and make that investment in the tank just to store it and have it irrigating your mesquite or palo verde. Um, some plants that maybe you do wanna start doing some rainwater harvesting and storage for is if you have a citrus tree, those are pretty high water need plants. Um, and these numbers here I have on the left, these are all for mature um, trees. So these are like kind of full size trees. A mature, mature citrus trees tree is going to want about 8,000 gallons of water per year. Most of that coming in the summertime. 
a mature pomegranate tree. So this is just generally a smaller tree than our citrus and our mesquite. So that's why it's needing less water, but compared to its size, it's still a relatively moderately um, water intense or water needy plant. And then of course our lawns and our veggies, I'd say rainwater harvesting is for your lawn and storing rainwater for your lawn is, it's a tricky game when you're thinking about irrigation. So I kind of always revert to planning for your veggie garden. And those are pretty high, that's a pretty high use water um, area or water needing space. We have the kind of average amount of water you'd want per gallon or average gallon amount you want per square foot of your veggie garden is between 40 to and 50 gallons per square foot of your veggie garden. To give you a little idea of like what we're talking about with rainwater tanks, we have a few different systems. We have the culvert system here. That's something we're not really seeing used as much anymore. We have our regular kind of in the bottom left, we have a regular plastic tank system. Um, this one's painted to match the side of the house. And then we also have our more unique shaped tanks. This is called a slimline tank. It's produced by a company called Bushman. And I like to call it the waffle tank. And it's a great tank if you're working with limited space and having a big cylindrical tank isn't quite accommodating your limitation for space. This will fit into smaller areas. Um, and this picture at the top is just to show you can get more than one tank and you can connect them and they're going to all be storing rainwater. A few basic systems of your active or basic um, parts to your active system are first, um, how is water flowing through, you know, to get to your tank? So we have your gutter system here that is directing water, directing rainwater from your roof. It's flowing, and this is kind of your collection area. We then plan to have a rain head or some kind, of, um, some kind of device to keep debris out of your tank. So that's filtering any debris that is leaf litter or sticks, twigs that are falling on your roof and getting picked up with that rain. And then we have a um, what we call a first flush. This is something that you can, you know, include in your system or not include. Uh, I think we're all kind of entering the, you know, starting rainwater harvesting. We're all beginners here, so I don't want to go too much in the detail, but a first flush, what it is, is it's a chance to let sediment that was on your roof kind of fall and follow this path and get stored in this part of the, the pipe before it fills up and overflows actually into your tank. So to use my cursor to kind of explain that a little slower is water is going to go through your rain head. It's going to follow the path of this little loop here and then it's go, going to go into what we call the first flush where it's going to flow in here. And essentially the idea is that first bit of rain that is hitting coming into contact with your roof that's picking up that sediment and maybe the pollen or any type of um, sediment that settled on your roof after a long period of uh, no rain or a long dry period, all that sediment is kind of collecting in this first flush system. And then it starts to fill up. And by the time the water fills up the pipe high enough to overflow and you actually go into the pipe that is connected to the tank, ideally that sediment has all washed out. Another thing to notice is we have two different types of systems we have, and that is inflow uh, systems. What, one is called a wet flow, wet inflow. And what that means is that water, when it's flowing through the tank or flowing through these pipes to reach your tank, there's a point where water is going to fill your tank and be sitting in your tank and it's going to, the water in your tank is going to be at the same level as the water in your pipe. So the reason we call it a wet inflow is because whatever level the water is sitting at in your tank, it's also sitting at in your pipe. So let's say the water is at where my cursor is resting here. The water is um, at the same level in both parts of the system. So we have a wet pipe or water in the pipe all the way down until it flows up into the tank. And that is a uh, kind of in comparison to what we call dry inflow, where it's much simpler, just pipe going from your gutters, connecting to your gutters, and then going straight into your tank, the top of the tank. When it's not raining, or after it's done raining, this tank or this pipe is totally empty. Um, 
after we've uh, kind of followed the path of the inflow, the tank is now full. I mentioned we always want to plan for overflow. And here we have, uh, I guess on the right side, it is a little bit more clear. What we have is the pipe that's going inflow into the tank. The water is filling up our tank, kind of circling the tank. And then once it reaches this point here, this is where our overflow is. So once the water gets this high in the tank, it's now overflowing into this pipe, going straight down. And this is the outlet. This is the exit point for the water that's um, overflowing from the tank. And we always want to plan for that because if you don't plan for your tank to overflow, it's going to overflow. You're just not going to have really much control of how it overflows or where that water goes. So we always want to plan for it. Um, and ideally, you direct that overflow to go to one of your basins or to go to some part of your garden. Um, to touch on a few of the important parts of your the a tank system, we have first, we always want to have some kind of tank filtration. Um, here in this picture here, we have a gutter guard. So this is keeping debris out of your gutters. We don't l do a lot of installations where we encourage people to use gutter guards, partially just because of a maintenance issue of, it's a little bit more work to jump on a ladder and need to check on these and clear them off. Um, something we do kind of lean more towards is what we call a rain head or debris filter. Um, and you can search these online. There's plastic ones. I believe it's called a leaf eater is the name of the type of debris filter. And what these are is these are capturing water that's flowing um, out of your gutter pipe. And it's allowing the debris to catch on this mesh screen here and not flow into your tank. And some of the benefit to this is the water is hitting this screen. The screen is generally in a place that you can see um, and don't have to climb up on a ladder to kind of see how filled with debris it is. Um, and it's also a place where, you know, maybe you do have to jump on a ladder to have access to be able to brush the debris off. But a lot of times it's, you know, in li like below your gutters and it's high enough that you can reach your hand up and just brush off any leaves or twigs that fell onto it. Um, another thing to plan for again is the overflow. The two types of overflows we have are a backflow preventer, which is just a one-way um, valve or one-way flap or backwater valve. There we go. Sorry. Backwater valve, which is just the end of a pipe or this valve here that is a one has a one-way flap. So water can exit the pipe, but nothing can go back in. So that is planning to prevent critters or mosquitoes from getting into the pipe. Another thing is what we call a pop-up. And that is just a cap that can go on the end of a PVC. It's, uh, we attach it onto a 90 fitting, so a right or angled um, fitting. And when water is flowing out of that, this little green piece here will pop up, water will overflow from there. And then once the water is done pushing the cap up, the cap will sit back flat down. A little bit about rainwater delivery. So once you have this awesome water stored in your tank, what, what is the best way to have it delivered to your plants? So a few things, rainwater, har rainwater tanks are really low pressure systems. They're very different from the, what we have, you know, connected to our hose bibs that are part of our regular potable water irrigation systems. And since they're really low pressure systems, we need to do everything we can to help, um, reduce the resistance or help encourage the water to flow through the system. The picture on the right here, we have two different types of hose bibs. The red capped one or the one with the red handle, that is what we traditionally see fitted to a, an irrigation system that is under city water pressure, so high pressure system. What we want to install on our rainwater harvesting tanks that have very low pressure are what we call full port hose bibs. So this opening you can see is as wide as it can get versus the opening on our um, typical hose bib is really small, but the water is getting pushed through that with really high pressure. And keeping that large opening, you know, should continue throughout your irrigation. I have noted one, one inch irrigation line is good. It, it just allows the water to flow a little bit more freely under low pressure. Um, and it stays stays true until you have reached the emitters. 
Um, ball valve emitters are a good option for rainwater harvesting or flag emitters are, are also a good option. And again, those are just emitters that are not relying on water pressure for the water to seep out. Again, if you're working, uh, a lot of irrigation timers are also set to be working with high pressure systems. There is an irrigation timer that is able to function with low pressure systems. We found that there's a brand called Toro that has a specific model that is meant for very low pressure systems. This is the old version of it. It's still the same. I think it's still a Toro brand, but it looks a little different if you were to go and search for it. It's a circular box now. Um, but yeah, just make sure you're looking for an irrigation timer that is able to handle low flow of water. And then just a quick little review. Here's a, a simple tank system. Uh, we have a roof that is our collection area. The roof is pitched, so it's directing the water to our gutters. The gutters are then sending our wa the water to that debris filter or the rain head. So that's what is collecting any twigs, leaves, and preventing it from entering the tank. Then we have PVC pipe that is directing water into the tank. So this is what we call our inflow. We have our awesome, beautiful sky blue tank storing our water. And once this tank fills up high, 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 it reaches our overflow and that overflow is this pipe here. I'm tracing it with my cursor and we have this planned, this overflow planned to go to a basin that's a little bit off screen. So once the tank fills up, it's getting away from the tank and going to a basin. Um, and then for, as for irrigation, we have a really simple setup here. This is just, we have that full port hose bib and we have it connected to a hose. And we actually, um, one of the pictures much earlier on when I pointed out our living lab where there was a little bit of a raised garden, a raised bed garden, that garden, um, we use this tank to irrigate that little garden. So with that, um, that's all this, those are all the slides I have. Are there any questions that people have? Any questions that came up in the chat? While we're waiting for additional um, questions in the chat, thank you so much, Charlie, for another wonderful presentation. I'm, I know I am, and I know our attendees will be soaking in all this great information that you shared with us tonight. Um, one question that Joanne answered in the chat, um, but that Valerie asked, are what are the approximate costs of tanks? Um, Joanne shared that she got her 55 gallon terracotta colored barrels from a neighbor for $10 a piece and that you can get sophisticated barrels for hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, but what's your, been your experience with the pricing of rain barrels or tanks? I think Joanne's really spot on. Um, if you're looking at, you know, larger volume tanks in the hundreds or thousands of gallons, you're also looking in the, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars. There's a lot more, you know, we did the little calculation showing how much water you can store. Um, that doesn't mean you have to store that water, but um, you know, once you're installing a tank, the bigger you go, kind of the more money cost benefit you have. Um, Joanne's with Joanne's setup, it's really cool to do recycled tanks and water storage. The thing we always like to say or point out, um, if you're getting a recycled tank, just know what was stored in that tank before um, you purchase it or, you know, before you start doing rainwater harvesting with it. I've seen 55 gallon barrel drums that are used for like pickling. And if you want to then turn that into a rainwater harvesting barrel, that's, you know, go for it. If you don't know where the tank or what the barrel has held, or if it's held chemicals, you're sending that to your landscape. Um, that's a little, you know, that's concerning. That's a little scary. So know how that water, um, know how the barrel was used before you, incorporate it into your system. And I think there's a company, um, I'm not sure how far north they are, but the place we get our tanks, one of them is called Ewing, E-W-I-N-G. You can check out their pricing online. Thank you so much, Charlie, for the advice, the tip on that, and then also sharing about <laughs> Ewing, because um, that's good that people have other additional resources to, to get rain barrels. Um, John said, shared that he got a 2,500 gallon for $1,200. Well, I think that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. <laughs> I think, way to go, John. <laughs> um, we just have some great comments coming in. So Kathy said, wow, so much to think about. Thank you so much for taking the time to teach us all about this important topic. I am so motivated to get this going. Yeah. 
Um, Pam I'm going to flash a few resources. Sorry, I'm going to keep this. Uh, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to keep this little slide up because I want people to be able to see these resources before they uh, head out. But let's go back to questions. <laughs> yeah, and then well, Pam just had another wonderful comment. She just said, "Excellent. I have some good base and ideas now." Super. Um, On oh. the topic of basins, I just wanted to point out there is um we have a program running right now called. BYOB, Build Your Own Basin, and there are a ton of resources on our website um, just showing how simple it is to build a basin, giving you ideas, giving you inspiration and encouragement. So check out, uh, I have it linked or the link showing, search watershed.org or watershedmg.org slash BYOB. There's just a, a lot of resources on getting you starting simple, starting small. Um, so take a look there. I love the name, very memorable, <laughs> very creative. I like it. <laughs> you can't forget that. Um, Joe just had a wonderful comment too. He's like, I don't have a question, but just wanted to let you know what a great presentation you provided. I have a sustainability presentation to give and this information will be of great assistance. One of my coworkers has a pretty large piece of property and I'm sure she'll find this very interesting. Glad to hear it. I don't see any additional questions in the chat as of right now. Um, but again, I just want to thank you, Charlie, and our attendees for joining us tonight. A uh, friendly reminder that I'll send a follow up email with the PowerPoint resources recording and a link to the survey. Um, remember, if you complete the survey by Monday, you'll be entered to win a free gift card from a local nursery. So don't forget to enter for that for a chance to win. Our next workshop in our Green Living series is Sonoran Desert Edibles on Wednesday, April 7th from 5.30 to 7 p.m., which is exactly two weeks from today. And we hope you can join us for another exciting evening. Have a great night, everyone, and take care. Again, Charlie has shared his um, information in case you have additional questions and resources, so feel free to reach out. But again, we'll be including um, resources that we shared in the chat and that Charlie shared in his presentation with you all, and you'll all be receiving his presentation slides as well. But I think that ends a great night, and thank you so much, Charlie, for a wonderful presentation. Thanks so much, Mone. Great to see you, and thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you, City of Glendale. Oh, thanks, Charlie. Bye, everybody. Be well. Good night, everyone.